Welcome to week four of Introduction to Linguistics. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been studying sounds, how sounds are produced by your mouth and your hands. We call that phonetics. Then we studied how your mind organizes sounds. Uh, sometimes it thinks that two sounds are the same or that two sounds are different. We call that phonology. This week, we're going to focus on morphology. So we're finally going to bundle those phonemes up so that they can mean something. Phonemes, indeed, can be put together into units that have meaning. For example, if we have the three phonemes cat, in English, we assign a meaning to those three phonemes. Um, they are the meaning of associated to this creature here. We're going to call this a morpheme. A morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning. Notice that this grouping of three phonemes has associated to one meaning, the one for the creature. If you have the sequence dog, this sequence is associated to a different meaning, the one with those creatures right there. We're going to call a minimal unit of meaning a morpheme. How do we know something's a morpheme? Because we cannot break it up any further. Like if you have the sequence cat and separate the sounds, then it no longer means anything related to a cat. You can have ca and t and for them to, they're not, they don't mean like face of the cat or paw of the cat. You need them together for them to mean cat. If, if you have a unit and it means something, and if you split it apart, it stops meaning that thing, then you know you've found a morpheme. It's a minimal bit of meaning. Cat. Um, words can be composed of one morpheme, like cat, but they can also have more than one. For example, in cats, you can separate that word into two bits and each of those bits has meaning. The first three uh, phonemes are cat, and they are the morpheme associated with this creature. The final phoneme is the S, s and that means plural. It means that there's many cats. So as you can see, this word has two parts that have clearly separable meanings. The first part is the meaning of the creature. The second one is how many of the creatures there are. Lots. Uh, the cat and the plural. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about these objects called morphemes. Morphemes can be free. Uh, if a morpheme is free, it means that it can function as its own word. For example, cat is a free morpheme because you can just say it on its own and it'll still mean the animal. There are morphemes that are bound because they only have meaning when they are attached to other morphemes. For example, the S in cats only means plural when it is attached to a noun. You can't just say S and then have that mean that there's a plurality of something. So this morpheme is bound because it only means plural if it is attached to a noun, in this case, cat. And by the way, um, what it does it need to be attached to? What it needs to be attached to is a root. We're going to separate morphemes into two main kinds, the root and the affixes. So roots are like the core meaning of a word. In cat, it's very obvious that the word is just the root cat. But in cats, it's also obvious that there's like a main part of the word, the one about the animal, cat, and then the S just sort of adds some additional grammatical meaning. So the root is the main part of the word, cat, and then this affix is sort of adding some additional grammatical dimension. So cat is the root for both of these words, and cats has an affix affixed to it. In English, roots can be free morphemes. For example, cat or dog 
the roots and they can also exist on their own as words. However, in some languages, roots are bound morphemes. For example, in Spanish, we can have a word like como, I eat. This word has a root, which is com, which means uh, to eat, and it has the affix o, which means I and present. So this part tells you the, the root of the verb, and this one tells you the tense and who's doing the verb, and but both but they're both bound because not, neither of them can exist on its own as a word. You can't just say o and have it be understood that it means I, and you cannot say com and for it to be the verb to eat. The, both of these need to be bound to one another. Whereas in English, your roots can just roam around being free. So we have uh, morphemes that are bound and free, and we have some morphemes that are the root and the affixes. And English has a lot of affixes. For example, the one for the third person singular of a verb, weights, weighted, is an, the ed is an affix, the past tense, the ing in waiting is an affix, it tells you that it's a progressive aspect, the comparative for an adjective, taller, is an affix. So all of these are affixes of English and they have to be bound to a root in English, for example, weight or tall. So we have roots and affixes that attach to them and add some additional part of meaning. There's two main types of affixes, inflectional and derivational. Inflectional affixes only add like a grammatical dimension. They don't, they don't really change the meaning of a word. For example, in I walk, he walks, uh, she's walking, they walked. The ver these four words, walk, walks, walking, and walked, are all essentially the same word. They all refer to the action of propulsion, but uh, the affix just changes the grammatical meaning a little bit, but they all essentially refer to the same action. This is an inflectional affix, which adds some additional grammatical meaning to the word. A derivational affix, on the other hand, changes the meaning a little bit. For example, when something is walkable, you're no longer talking just about the action, but about being able to perform the action. Also, you changed the type of word. It was a verb, the root was a verb, and you changed it into an adjective. It's walkable. Same as if somebody is a walker. You change a verb to a noun. So these affixes are called derivational because they change the meaning of the whole word. A walker is not the same as to walk. So those are derivational affixes, the ones that change meaning a little bit. And just as a quick review, so we are going to describe morphemes using these words. For example, cat has two morphemes. This first part is a root that is a free root because it can exist on its own as a word. The second morpheme in this word is s, which is a, an affix. So it's affixed to the root. It is a bound morpheme because it cannot exist on its own. And it is inflectional because it's adding another bit of grammatical meaning. It's cat, it's just there's many of them. Breakable has a free root, break, and it has an affix which attaches to the root. It is a bound affix because there's no word able that can exist on its own. And it is derivational because it changes the word from a verb to an adjective. And it also changes the meaning a little bit for something to be breakable. Right. A couple more things. Morphemes have productivity. There are morphemes that can attach to a lot of words. For example, the li in loudly, softly, slowly, rapidly, vividly, and you can think of many more. So this morpheme li for having the quality of uh, is very productive. It can attach to many words. There are morphemes that are less productive. For example, the th for uh, also having the quality of warm, warmth, having healing, health, having width, having being having wide <laughs> width, uh, being deep depth. 
So this morpheme can attach to quite a few words, but not to all of them. You can't say cool for how cool you are, for example. And there's morphemes that are not productive at all. So for example, the let in piglet for a tiny pig is not very productive because you can't have a doglet, a catlet, or a horselet. So there are morphemes that can attach to a lot of words, to some words, or to, pra to practically just very few words. Finally, a quick word about roots. If you have a root, it can be of two kinds. It can be a content word, which has a lot of meaning attached to it, like cat, dog, and duck. Or it could be a function word, which are mainly grammatical words in a language, like for, at, in. So it is very difficult to imagine, like with your imaging brain, what for could possibly mean. But it is performing an important function in the language. These are function words, and these are content words. So that was a quick intro to morphology. A morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning. And a morpheme is built of one or more phonemes. And of course, words can have one or more morphemes. Morphemes can be described as being bound or free. They're free if they can stand on their own as a word. They can be roots or affixes. Root is the main meaning and the affix is some um, additional meaning that is being added. They can be inflectional or derivational. Inflectional morphemes add grammatical meaning, and derivational morphemes change the meaning. Free roots can be content or function. They're content if they are uh, words with a lot of meaning, like cat and dog. They're function if they're just parts of the language, uh, grammatical parts, like for and at. And morphemes can be very productive, or they can be very unproductive. In the next video, we'll focus on affixes.